So this is just a photo of a parking lot and a, um, they, they raised the train tracks where the transit is. And the next photo shows the mixed use building that they built there. Um, they created an arm's length development corporation to partner with developers on, on major projects like this to get them in the strategic places they needed them. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town channel. I'm John Summerman, and that is Dr. Tristan Cleveland with the Happy Cities organization. And we are gonna be talking about happy cities, what it takes to create happy cities, and some of his research that he has done, which went into him uh, being able to earn his doctoral degree. Uh, it is a good one, but it is a long one. And in fact, this is gonna be part one of a two-part series. Uh, we'll come back and uh, give you the second half in a couple days. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Tristan Cleveland. Dr. Tristan Cleveland, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's really my pleasure to be here. You, li you like how I slipped that in there, you know, they're calling you Dr. Tristan Cleveland, because you are you know, re recently uh, earned your PhD. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, it was a, a huge project and uh, it's, it's really exciting to have now, but you know, I don't want to just leave this as a study on the shelf. I really want to put what I was studying into practice and, and uh, keep up the work because uh, as you know, what I was working on really goes to the heart of the biggest challenges that cities face today. And, and I want to dig into it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but let's sure. uh, pause just a moment to, to give you an opportunity to, to introduce yourself to the audience. So who is Tristan Cleveland? Hi, folks. So um, I am an urban planner and I work at a company called Happy Cities. And Happy Cities works with governments and developers uh, around the world to help them design communities and developments to support the basic needs of, of human well-being. So making sure that communities support um, health and social connection and even things like meaning and just ensuring that when you walk outside, you feel good. You look around and, and the things that you see, the things you hear and feel make you feel good and make you want to spend time in that place. So that's what we specialize in. They uh, happily allowed me to take four years to do my PhD on how to redesign suburban communities to achieve these goals. And now I'm back at work full time trying to do this in practice. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And uh, in, and that, that sounds all colorful and fun and, and everything. And, and we'll talk a little bit about Happy Cities as an organization and Happy City, the book, in just a moment. But I want to give some love to that paper that you wrote. And uh, here it is. <laughs> and I'll be sure to pay, uh, uh, include a, a link to this landing page for your paper, as well as uh, I see that you can uh, click on the P uh, PDF of it as well. So that'll be included in the show notes of this uh, broadcast episode for the audio only, as well as the, the video description below. Uh, talk just a, a briefly a little bit about, you know, like you said, this four year commitment to writing this paper and, and, uh, and basically earning that doctoral degree. Yeah. So the, the most shocking thing to me about finishing this thesis is that people have actually been reading it. <laughs> <laughs> which usually does not happen with PhD theses. But uh, so this, this PhD was about um, how do we take uh, totally car dependent suburban communities and redesign them into places where people can, can walk and bike and, and um, have that interaction between uh, retail on the street and the street and transit and public spaces so that they're all reinforcing each other's success, which simply isn't possible in communities where you have massive parking lots separating every destination and where you have giant roads that makes it very dangerous and uncomfortable for people to cross the street. And the basic challenge is, you know, how do we get from here to there? Right. How do we get from this context where walking is a disaster to what a lot of communities want to achieve, which is creating a main street for their community, creating a really wonderful place people are proud of where you can hold a parade. How do you convince those first developers to build a building that doesn't have massive parking and instead has entrances and retail facing the sidewalk in a context where no one walks and everybody drives? It. Go ahead. I was going to say, and, and we're going to actually get 
into that visually because you sent some uh, photos along. And so we'll dive a little bit in a little bit. We'll dive into some of those examples and tee the, tease those out. Uh, but before we do that, um, let's let's also just kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about that context that you meant that you mentioned earlier, which is you've been working for the company Happy Cities. Now, this is a uh a consulting firm. And, and this consulting firm is, you know, part of and, and was born out of the book, Happy City, which is here. And so talk a little bit about that transformation. Um, I, I had mentioned to you before that I, I do know Ch- Charles, excuse me, Montgomery. And we, uh, I had read the book and, and this is like one of the most influential books um, of my establishing the active towns initiative and uh, and then I had the opportunity to 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 meet uh, Charles Montgomery right after he published the book I have it listed here on my both my active towns featured books for the podcast right there because we're talking about it right now but it's also down below because I actually have different categories it's also down below in the active towns classics uh, part of my library here and then you'll also see some other uh, uh, interesting books uh, in the living sciences we're going to talk a little bit about all of that kind of stuff in just a little bit but Talk a little bit about Man, that. That is a great book list there, by the way. I, I really look forward to re- looking through what you have there. <laughs> kind of slide through. Ooh, yeah. I forgot yeah, about that book. Those are some good ones. Want but to see talk about this evolution that, that took sure. place from this book to, to this running a consultancy. company. Yeah. yeah, running a consultancy. Yeah. yeah so um, Charles Montgomery was was a journalist, right? Not, not an urban planner. And he... I'd written a number of other books and other subjects and, and got into this issue of like, why do we keep building cities that don't make us happy, that, that undermine our well-being? I mean, what are we building cities for if not for humans? You know, like, what are we doing? It's insanity. So he wrote this, this incredible book full of really great stories that just really um, underlines the practical things that we can do to to achieve better human happiness through design. And a lot of people I've met actually got into urban planning because they read this book, you know, so it, it's really had a big impact. And after he finished it, you know, unlike his other books, people started calling him up and saying, okay, let's do it. Let's make this happen. And so he uh, started wondering, okay, what, uh, okay, obviously I need to start a company, you know, like people are actually coming to my door asking me to to help them uh, make this stuff happen. So uh, he put together you know, a bunch of experts in the field. And since then, for the last over a decade, we've been helping developers and cities around the world implement these ideas. And really, what we focus on is taking the best research that exists, you know, um, really translating that research and often even doing our own research. Um, to make sure that the the designs that we put together and the recommendations we offer aren't just you know things that look pretty, but that are really really supporting um, social ties and health and all these things that matter so much for us. Yeah, and I've uh, kind of gone over to your landing page here on the website, and so this is your your background and your it gives a little bit uh, more uh, information about yourself. And then uh, some of the projects that you have worked on uh, as part of the um, Happy Cities organization. What a, what a cool group, what a cool company, what a cool concept. And it sounds like you've been working with them for, for quite some time now. Yeah, that's right. And I feel very lucky because it's a company where their values really align with my own. And they actually want me to spend time writing blog posts that try to push the field further. Or, uh, you know, we have uh, research projects on the side where we're trying to figure out how to make this kind of good design standard practice across the board. I mean, we're, we're doing multiple presentations this year with the Canadian Institute of Planners and, and other organizations pitching this idea of creating a designation across the country for walkable, pedestrian-friendly places so that it would become easy for communities anywhere in Canada to just draw a circle on a map and say, okay, this area is walkable. And suddenly, a whole different set of standards would apply that support 
pedestrian priority design that focuses on on people rather than moving the most cars possible. And it's not every company that would allow me to pursue an idea like that and really try to turn it into reality where there's no there's no immediate profit there. You know, down the road that could turn into something where we could start consulting on that, et cetera. But they really have this this faith in in us, their team, to to try to push forward the profession and come up with new valuable ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So what was sort of your background uh, education wise as you sort of found your way to uh, the Happy Cities organization and then, uh, like I said, t- took about four years to try to focus on doing the doctoral work? What was what was that original uh, sort of foundation, educational foundation for you? Yeah, so I did my undergrad in political science and history, my, my master's okay. in urban planning at McGill. And then okay. um, I went and worked in, in Guyana and Venezuela, which was quite the yeah. learning experience. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Then I, I actually worked for many years as an um, advocate for sustainable planning in Halifax. And oh, okay. a, a lot of what motivated both the, the thesis and the other work that I'm doing What's the frustration I ran into as an advocate, you know, where we're asking for um, government to be doing stuff that should be standard practice, you know, right. having yeah. to beg for things like safe streets where people can walk with their children outdoors during the yeah. day without having to worry about their, their children dying, you know, right. yeah. um, like <laughs> this shouldn't be something that we have to push hard for. This should just be the way it works. Right. And uh, then actually after I, I finished um, working as an advocate, I also uh, worked as a, a campaign manager for a local councillor, okay. kicked out the incumbent, got him elected. So I've, I've been involved from advocacy, from research, from politics, and also as a professional consultant. So I've seen the, the issues from many angles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oftentimes when we think of activity, we think of exercise. So someone says, oh, yeah, I have an active lifestyle. Oh, what are you doing for exercise? It's, or, 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 you know, this is an active town. Well, you know, what does that mean? You know, and so I try to bring it back to the, the words that you had just talked about of what are we doing to create a more walkable environment? Talk a little bit about that from, from a cultural perspective and how we're kind of living in an environment that is a biological disconnect with the human habitat. And these are terminologies that uh, Professor Lieberman, Daniel Lieberman uses in his books of the fact that, yeah, we are one of the reasons why we have chronic disease and unhappiness is because we are living in a biological disconnect an evolutionary biology disconnect with what we as a species were used to. If you look at the design of our physical environment, the communities around us and what the, the, default the easiest behavior in these environments are that the default is to be alone overweight underslept and distracted right so there are a few things that you have to get right for human beings to be healthy and happy and and they're like the the the, the magic cure-alls the things that affect everything so we need to to, to sleep enough but critically we need to be physically active and socially connected, or we're not going to be healthy. We're not going to be happy. Right. And our environments make this so hard. It's like playing a video game on hard mode. You know, we've decided to make it as, as difficult as possible to achieve the basics. Um, for uh, physical activity, um, you know, basically everything in our body evolved under the assumption that we'd be very physically active, burning 3,000 calories a day or more. Right. But to achieve the, the greatest impacts on health, to prevent our body from basically entirely falling apart, we don't need all of those 3,000 calories of, of like intense exercise. Right. You know, we just need to walk, uh, you know, roughly 20 minutes a day of, of just enough to make sure that our, our muscles are contracting, are, are being used because the entire system is, is based on the assumption that we could get rid of excess energy by pumping it to muscles. And if muscles don't contract, there's actually a system where they refuse to take in any excess energy. And then that ends up getting you know stuck in our organs and causing many other problems. That is a, a huge simplification. But the, the basic message is to you know 
say 80% or whatever it is of the benefit comes from that first 150 minutes a week of just walking, which can be achieved just by going to the grocer, going to the buy some bread, just, you know, if we build this into our, our, if we design communities where the most convenient way, so the most convenient way to get our daily needs is to walk just a little bit, then we've done most of the benefit for making sure that our bodies work. And then once you have that foundation, then yeah, if you want to exercise, you can go above and beyond that and get the extra health benefits. But at least you've done the majority of the benefit already. And it's easier to do that exercise because you're already minimally active. But there was a study in Alberta that found that um, if the, the most healthy active quarter of people only got 10% of their exercise from, from dedicated recreational exercise, 90% of their physical activity came from their daily needs from from just living their life. Um, so if we really want to make any progress on public health, as well as so many other issues, we need to design it into our communities. Yeah, yeah. And if you'll indulge me, um, it, this is like right at the core of my typical stump speech and my presentation keynote address. And, uh, and this is how I phrase it. I'm like, yeah, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is that we have this rather complicated relationship with physical activity. And it, it's literally one of the most natural things that we can do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's, and when I say natural thing that we can do, I mean, just look at small children and how when they are, you know, able to play and do things, they will dash off and run and just they're yeah. like little natural athletes quite, uh, quite inherently. And yet this gets to your point. It's like, yes, we have to make it convenient. We have to make it engaging and we have to make it fun uh, for activity. But then we also have to acknowledge that we have a very, very complicated relationship with physical activity. And we are inherently, we have like what I call uh, the lazy gene. We have this yeah. inclination that if there's an easier way, we are hardwired to conserve energy. And so yeah. we have a situation like this where in San Diego, California, where it's probably 75 degrees in this photo, they're taking the escalator to go into the 24 hour fitness to get on yeah. the Stairmaster looking out right. at that very same escalator right. you know, to, to, to do the workout. It's not like this was a, a hot, humid environment mm -hmm. and they, they didn't want to get too sweaty before they went into air conditioning. I mean, give me a break. But the point is, is that it's, it's a, it's a series of things that we have to do within our built environment because we have literally designed activity out of our lives. That's right. uh, and so that's, that's one of the things that, that I wanted to sort of highlight here and also, you know, give a shout out to uh, professor Lieberman. You had given his uh, book, The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease, a shout out in uh, the podcast with Chuck Marone. Uh, his yeah. most recent book is Exercised and really examining, he examines the that relationship of uh, the difference between physical activity, just living life, you know, act, you know in an active way form. You had referenced the fact that, you know, it, through evolutionary time, you know, when we were hunter gatherers, we, you know, spent about that 3000, you know, calorie expense getting, you know, getting out there and doing it. Exercise as an activity is quite foreign to us when he yeah, goes and absolutely. runs, you know, in the, in the Savannah with, uh, when, as he's studying the indigenous populations that are still out there, he, they like, what is he doing? He's expending <laughs> extra energy and calories. Without so, a goal, without something practical being achieved. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so one of my taglines is, is to say that, yes, the human body, we have the ability to do extraordinary things. We can, you know, run a hundred mile uh, ultra marathon. We can do the Ironman distance triathlon. These are extraordinary things that ordinary people can achieve and do. But at the same time, we're literally hardwired to do this. Yeah. I mean, it's like 1% <laughs> of people are, are doing that level of physical activity, you know, exactly. choosing to. So it's just not a, it's not a generalized solution. It's not, you know, when you look at photos from people in the 1950s and they were all 
thin and you can hardly see an overweight person. It wasn't because they were all running ultra marathons, you know, uh, running as a, as an activity only became popular in, uh, later 60s, 70s, whatever it was. Yeah. And I think that that brings up the, the, the context of what this, you know, movie was about. This is from Wally, uh, yeah. is that literally you didn't have to, to lift much of a finger to even do anything. We literally have designed so much exertion out of our daily lives. But it sounds like what you guys are saying is that uh, putting some of that activity back in makes us happier. Yeah, it <laughs> sure does. I mean, uh, the, the impact on our mind of having just a bit of physical activity is just profound. It's, it's the, the basis, not only physical health, but mental health. And, and also a lot of the other things that, that make us happy also encourage physical activity. So um, a lot of experts who work in this field, they, they focus on, you know, the number of practical destinations that you can walk to near home, which is very important. But we can't miss the quality of the environment that you walk through. So I wrote this piece uh, a while back called The Responsibility of the Building to the Street that was published in Planetism, where I made the argument that the only way that we can create communities that are are human-friendly and physically active are if we make sure that every single building along every single street creates a wonderful environment. So, And that requires a few things. Greenery, it requires visual complexity, which modern architecture is, is terrible for. It requires not having blank walls. It requires, to the extent possible, having like human scale buildings and also buildings that have evidence of, of human interaction. So a storefront is the best or a patio is the best, but balconies also work, or at least doorways, windows, anything that makes sense for the economic and cultural context of that street. It sounds like what you're talking about in that sense is kind of what um, uh, Ann Sussman talks about in cognitive architecture. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, got no, the, I, exactly. Yeah. 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 And I haven't got that book yet, but I, I'm familiar oh, with Ann white. Sussman's work. Yeah, no, check, no, out, I, ch- check out my interview with her. So, yeah, it's, oh, it's yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I look yeah. forward to it. Yeah, no, yeah. Her, she's brilliant. And um, it's so important. So, uh, you know, she's doing work on trying to provide a stronger scientific foundation for understanding of these needs for, for how we feel when we walk down the street. And I'm really grateful for people like her who is doing that work because we need to um, convince people that this isn't, this isn't just an aesthetic preference thing. This is, you don't just see the buildings, you feel them. Like when you, we, we know that there are certain basic requirements for creating streets where unconsciously we are willing to stop. We will spend time there. We will, Yan Gale has done this great research where on some streets, uh, if there's like blank walls and it just feels um, hostile, then if you see a friend, you'll say hi and keep walking. Whereas if you're on a good street with, you know, a uh, visual mix and, and it's just an attractive place with, um, with, with clear evidence that, that humans use the space, it feels like a place for humans, then people actually stop and talk to each other. Actually, we did a study. I love this study. We, this was in Seattle. We had um, volunteers stand on street corners looking at a map uh, pretending to be lost and we did this in two places one in front of a a storefront with lots of architectural details and greenery and another in front of a concrete blank wall on a loading bay and the people who were stopped to help in the one location were um i I don't want to mix up the numbers but i think they were five times more likely to stop like seven more times more likely to pull out their phone and, and four times more likely to actually walk the person to the destination to show them how to be there. So when you create those human-friendly environments that take seriously our, our basic needs as, as people, our, our, our subconscious needs for a comfortable street, then people treat each other better. They're, 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 the way they behave, the way they interact changes. And this has a profound impact on health because when people are willing, people need to be willing to walk streets for them to, you know, make that a part of their life. It's not enough that there's a destination they could in theory walk to. It needs to be a desirable walk. And then beyond just health, if we want to create the full spectrum of a good life, we it's those good streets that are designed for people with every single building and every single design detail in the street designed for humans that uh, leads us to socializing more, that leads us to lingering on the street, creating that sense of vibrancy. So 
you uh, you just brought up this this diagram. Yeah, because what you were describing to me was like, OK, I see, you know, we got the building, we've got the the human scale sort of uh, interaction that can take place here. You mentioned greenery. We've got the yeah. greenery. And so I, I'm like, yeah, we, we got to integrate this into that conversation because yeah, we also so, have that street life. Yeah. So I have a simple diagram to emphasize why this is so difficult to achieve. So, you know, when you walk a street like this one in the photo where there's lots of people and businesses and transit and street life, it feels easy. It feels like there's nothing complicated at all about this, right? But if you have, uh, you know, like a, a suburban area with big parking lots, it is so hard to get to this place where you actually have that kind of vibrancy. And you, it needs to be cultivated. It's not something you can just build at once because it's not just a physical environment. It's also the people spending time there. So a way to think about this is, okay, you got to get some homes first. And then once you have homes, uh, you have some people walking on the street. And if enough people walk on the street and you can convince developers to build retail on the sidewalk, which is the hard part, right? And we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, then you can create more street life because people are going to those businesses. And when those businesses are there and you have a slightly vibrant street, that increases the value of building homes. So that attracts more development, more homes. And then all this starts to reinforce each other because the homes and businesses create more street life, more street life creates a more desirable place to build homes and businesses. And then transit supercharges all of this because transit brings more street life, more customers to businesses, uh, increases the value of homes even further. And all of these things help bring transit riders. So the the basic challenge that faces us, the those of us who want to create healthy, happy, walkable cities, is to kickstart this cycle and to cultivate it and to not undermine it with big, ugly, wide roads, to not undermine it with big, blank walls because, because some star architect with the oversized ego decided that he wanted to do something shocking and have a big blank wall in the street. It means that we, we can't screw up. We, every single decision we make has to support more people wanting to spend time on that street, more people wanting to open up businesses, reinvesting in transit as transit roads become successful. And then over time, you can create more and more successful places. Do you actually, do you want to go over to the um, amoeba diagram? Yeah. Be a good time to chat about that. Pop over the amoeba here, which is a couple over. So, yeah, yeah. So I just recently wrote a blog post about this on the Happy Cities website, um, which I encourage people to check out. But this is, I I love this research. This is by a guy named Todor, apologies, Todor, Todor Strovanowski. Hope I didn't screw that up. (laughs) I'm not highly practiced in Swedish names. Sounds pretty good to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Sorry, Todor. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Traditionally, uh, the uh, the idea in transit-oriented development is that um, if you build a transit station and you have lots of homes and businesses within walking distance, so say 400 or 800 meters of the transit station, then you will create healthy, walkable streets. And Todor said, um, I think it's not quite so simple. <laughs> so he it's not. Um, walked the streets of multiple cities in Sweden and he mapped out where you actually find that kind of vibrancy that I was just talking about. So those places where um, street level businesses and public spaces and people and transit all reinforce each other to create this this vibrancy, this place where people are actually outside. Um, and he found that it's it's not just randomly scattered over 400 meters. It's all within, most of it's within about 100 meters of stations. Not coincidentally, that is how far we can easily see things. Right. So if you really want to create vibrancy, you need to focus on what humans actually can see when they exit stations what businesses they can see, because those are the things they actually go to. And then um, if you want to extend that street life, you need to to cultivate it outward. So you need to focus on um, if people are walking and spending time in this chunk of street, can we invite them a little bit further? Can we make investments, placemaking, color, whatever? Can we encourage people to open up businesses uh, to extend that vibrancy a bit further? So it really is like, like a plant he calls it an amoeba right because these right, right. these the, if you map out these places with street life it's, it forms like a blob on the map and yeah. uh, but it is like a life form that we need to grow outwards and like i said at the start it's not something that you can just build 
top down and just yeah. command that there be street life in a place because it involves this interaction of, of people, businesses, buildings and transit. Yeah. One of the things that, that I like to emphasize um, with that relationship to what we're seeing here on, on this image, uh, and we'll try to describe this for the listening audience as well. So we're looking at these concentric circles um, that are you know extended out from uh, where the transit stops are. And these are the nodes. These are, quote unquote, the walk shed, using the yeah. terminology. This is the, Now, these circles are just meters. 100 meters, so much smaller than the usual and they're even smaller shed. than, than so that. this is the the the, the visible shed <laughs> yes yeah, so this is the visible shed and and yeah. and that matters too because you know what do you see when you get you know to this particular stop here you're able to see that you've got this this active uh bike lane you've got yeah. uh, an active um vibrant pedestrian realm you've got yeah. the articulation of the buildings surrounding yeah. it you also Lots have street trees you know yeah. you've got you know got some shade that, that's happening here so there's a lot of vibrancy a lot of things going on and so what you're really saying here is that that first hundred meters is crucial in crucial terms, crucial if yeah. you screw that up doesn't matter what else you do uh, you know w- what often happens is the you know if, if those streets around transit are you know just blank walls or whatever they act as a funnel and and just scoot people away and so all of that potential, all of that human potential, all of these people spending time in a place every single day that could be supporting businesses and destinations that could make transit even more successful, that could drive the success of the city and, and our health and happiness is instead just being wasted as people get funneled away to distant places. Yeah. Um, not to hijack your your analogy here or, or your, your talk on it with the amoeba, um, but one of the things that I think has been so instrumental in, in my learnings with active towns is how crucial it is to have active mobility modes integrated with transit. And so it, it's what you're really talking about here is, is there a there there? you know, at these places, at these stops, you know, it's, it, it's, it's that concept of, is this a true place worth staying and lingering? The other thing that, that, that I'm referencing though, is that part of what makes the Dutch transit system work so incredibly well is that they're able to lean into transit and the use of the train system to get from city to city. And, their ability to have a comprehensive walking and biking network that overlays to that transit network. And so they end up doing such a great job of attracting people in from the, from the more distant neighborhoods by people getting on their bike, getting to the transit station, getting on the transit, going to their destination, getting off. They can get on another bike and go to their destination if it's too far for walking. But more often than not, they have that ability. And so one of the things that I'm like really examining is as we like look to these other places like Sweden, which is where this is from, or the Netherlands or Copenhagen and and many others, is how do we take the reality that our built environment isn't that those those distances. I mean, and that's where I think our real big opportunity is to lean in towards the bicycle and to lean in towards uh, that ability to have a ninefold increase to that cap that you know catchment area. And like you said, really do a good job of this, really do a good job at that hundred meter of those transit areas being incredibly vibrant and attractive, et cetera. But then also because our, our transit systems are suffering because we don't have a good active mobility catchment area. We have people having to drive to use transit. By that time, they might as well just keep driving. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Your parking rides are, are, are not very effective. Um, what you want to be doing is, is creating, you know, a, a, the city around the transit station. So all those jobs and economic activity is happening right there and that people can, can be active near it rather than, yeah, like you said, if, if you're already driving, you might as well keep going. I, I think it's helpful to divide two different kinds of destinations when you get off transit. So one is 
home and work. And you will go, you will get to home and work whether you can see it or not, right? So for that, it's useful to think about that 400 meter, 800 meter catchment area for walking or the whatever it is for bicycle, where it, which is, you said nine times longer. I think that's about right. Like, you know, people will bike, are, are willing to bike quite a long ways. Uh, and with e-bikes, it's even further. And so that makes sense for jobs and for home. But for everything else, we really need to be paying attention to what people can actually see. And that's just as true for bikes. So for cyclists, are there opportunities along the biking route that they can get off? And there's lots of activity happening. And for cyclists as well, like it matters whether the environment is a desirable place where they want to spend time, just, just like for pedestrians. Absolutely. Um, because cyclists like pedestrians are... Well, they're human beings. I mean, they're they're out in the world. They're like participating in the world as opposed to being inside a machine. Exactly. And I even hesitate to call somebody who rides a bike a cyclist. It's just right. a person I, riding a bike. It just oh, like it's a person walking. is such walking. a weird word, right? Like, exactly. You know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, um, there's, there's engineering reports and, and standards that refer to walking as an alternative form of transportation, which is yeah. the most mind-boggling uh, thing imaginable. Like, there's only one. How do you how do you go from like the, the original with. mobility mode to yeah, alternative? Yeah. You know? <laughs> the fundamental human mobility mode. If cities don't yeah. work for that, then they don't work for humans. I mean, it really is yeah. that simple. Yeah. Um, it, it's so, like, folks, yeah, go back and read these books. Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so Daniel Lieberman in that book, I mean, yeah. he really, he makes this argument that when you look at what we evolve for, it just doesn't match up with how we've designed our environment. And when we're designing our environment, we, we have to go back to first principles on what we evolve for. So how about let's let's talk about transforming some sub- suburbs into yeah, these let's, uh, let's, places. Let, let's, let's roll the dice. Which one do you want to go to first? Yeah, so let's head over to Surrey and, and go to that Surrey 1 image because I, I want to talk about, um, so I was talking about this challenge of, of cultivating this interaction of businesses and street life. And I, I just want to talk about how that, that challenge in practice because I've read people said that it's, it's impossible. Well, it's not impossible, but it is really hard. It is very, very difficult. Why don't you set this up in terms of context? Uh, we do have an international audience of people uh, tuning in from around the globe. Uh, I think I know where Surrey is, uh, but for, <laughs> for anybody who may not be uh, sur- super familiar with uh, Surrey, uh, what's the context of this location? So Surrey at? is a suburb of Vancouver especially the area we're going to be talking about here was built around a highway. And so all the commercial development on it was just strip malls. So a lot of auto body shops like this one, big roads, big strip malls. And that's all I had for the center of the community. And if you go back to like the 1960s, 1970s, people already hated this. You know, this is not an environment people like. They like their homes. They like their single family homes. But they hate that the the center of their community is designed around the car and not around people. They'd like to have a place where they can visit and walk. But how do you get there? Because like I was saying, you need businesses and and people and development to and homes to all reinforce each other. But when you're in this situation, how do you convince that first developer to build a building with that business facing the street, not a parking lot? And also the a mixed use building like that is more expensive to build. And why would people pay a, a premium or agree to live in a smaller unit in a building that has a view over parking lots, right? So to kickstart this kind of growth, to get that first pedestrian-friendly, mixed-use, walkable development to happen, you need to get people to believe in the place. And that requires government intervention. It requires some kind of investment to change the reality on the ground and, and, and at least in one place, kickstart growth. Let's describe both of these, uh, these photos here. So the first one is just, you know, a dreary road with an auto body shop. And, and humorously, it actually has um, a brick sidewalk, which is part of an early effort to create a main street there, which is just surrounded by like dead crabgrass and old broken up parking lots. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the bricks and the sidewalk aren't doing much here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then in the second photo is a wide road with a strip mall behind it. And oh, I wouldn't even call that a road. I, this is clearly a strode. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a strode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a classic, classic, classic strode. So, and by not, wide, not a, how many lanes are we talking about here? Well, this is six lanes. So it's not 
It's not that bad compared to a lot of American <laughs> strodes, but it's bad enough. It's bad know? enough. It's or bad enough. Yeah, it's not a comfortable place to cross, you know. My and my, and the and and again the ever present, you know, sea of asphalt pop parking lot too. Yeah, I mean, the majority of the community was asphalt, not not for humans. So they in the early '90s they built um, high speed elevated transit. This is a photo here, folks of. Uh, uh, high-speed elevated transit route to downtown Vancouver. And it was hoped that this would kickstart growth. So they had this new plan. Everything was in place to allow high-density growth. And and nothing happened for over a decade. Nothing happened. There was just one new building built, put a university in it. That was something, but nothing else. Um, so then they decided that they're going to make a major investment in this one place. This is a map of Surrey. And a lot of the times when government invests in their communities, they they spread it out and they waste it. So they'll in Surrey, they decide they're going to build a city hall, a library, and a mixed-use tower partnering with, with uh, private developers. And yeah, often, you know, the city would put the library over here on one corner and put the city hall over there on that corner. But instead, they're saying, no, we're going to do all of this on one block directly next to transit. See, this is a five-lane, again, strode, and we've got our strip mall here. What am I missing about this uh, before we go to the transformation? Well, it's, it's just not a, a people-friendly environment whatsoever. Well, it's got, it's got decorative lights right there. What's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about it, yeah. So, I mean, just the size of the road, the speed of traffic, and the fact that there's parking lots in front of the commerce means that this just isn't a place where anyone would want to linger or spend time. Yeah, and it looks like this was circa 2019. Yeah. So... They put in a median and reduced it to four lanes. Now, part of one of the themes of my PhD was it's hard for people to get the full way to people-friendly design because there's a lot of political controversy. The hardest thing of all is to reduce the size of streets. That's a difficult nut to crack because a lot of car-dependent residents actually love the idea of having a, a beautiful place they can visit that you know they can get out of their car and spend an afternoon walking. You know, that's that's a lovely thought, right? But if you start talking about reducing their four, five, eight lane roads down to two lanes, then they start to get very angry because <laughs> okay. well, that affects their ability to get to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and part and part of, part of this is too it is an irrational fear that it will absolutely destroy their life, and and I say irrational fear because. What we do know is that if something happens, like, you know, an earthquake happens and the Embarcadero Freeway comes down and blah, 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 us humans, yeah, we adapt. I mean, that's that's the beautiful thing about us as a species is we do adapt. And uh, the other thing when it comes down to the, the species uh, car motivists or whatever you want to call us, <laughs> yeah, automobilitis, is that the the that evaporation of traffic just kind of happens too. And so it is a, somewhat of an irrational fear that if this had been transformed into one lane in each direction, that it would be complete chaos and it would be gridlock and everything. It, that doesn't really ever happen um, because of the homeostasis. People change their habits. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, people plan around it. And, and it's amazing the extent to which people can plan around it. And when you have a high-speed rail to downtown and, and you start... In, investing in uh, higher quality bike lanes as they have been doing. Yeah. Um, you create the conditions for people to adapt into active modes, which take much less space and allow more people to move at the same time without causing trouble for each other. Now, let me, let, let, I, I'm, I'm concerned about those, those decorative lights and make sure that, oh yeah, they, they didn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> so this is a major theme in my, my PhD that, so I mentioned briefly early this idea of creating like walkable designations across Canada where like uh, if you want to use American lingo context classifications, but like saying that there's a separate kind of design applies to these areas. And one of my motivations for that is to get away from this problem we have where whenever we try to implement walkability, we're, we're always half-assing it always across the board. We're always making these compromises. And it's because, you know, we understand that airplanes need to be done to a certain level of standards. And we understand that, um, you know, it's not okay if you build a building for it to fall down sometimes. 
But when it comes to walkability, walkability, we are constantly compromising the core requirements. So designing lighting to be for cars rather than than for people. Though to be fair, if, if we go back there, um, and just realizing that, you know, they on the one side of the pole, the lighting is aimed at cars, and the other side of the pole is aimed at people. So maybe this is actually a good design. But yeah, in general, we need to recognize up front that if we really want to create an active town, it's going to require some sacrifices and to be much more honest and clear about that so that if you want the full benefits of a truly vibrant place, we're willing to reduce the size of streets and get rid of parking requirements. You use the terminology of sacrifices. I believe that those are still just kind of perceived and feared sacrifices where in reality, it, it really isn't. I mean, the I don't really see transforming this into having one less uh, mobility lane in each direction and, uh, you know, eliminating parking minimums is really all that much of a sacrifice because ultimately there's so much automobility baked into our system that I don't really think that it, it is an actual sacrifice versus a perceived sacrifice. Right. Right. Politically, I don't know if we can just tell people that, you know, it'll have, you know, that they're crazy, that it'll have no impact. But I think we can convince them that the impact is less than they might expect and that the benefits are worth it. So it's, it's, well, I mean, I think it's a that's where question. that's where yeah. that's where pilot projects really, you know, Absolutely. tactical urbanism and pilot projects really help yeah. demonstrate that those are, in fact, irrational fears. Yeah, yeah. In New York, they showed that when they reduced it to one lane, they often increased throughput because you didn't have people fighting between lanes, et cetera. And it's just more yeah. efficient. The intersections well, are more efficient. Yeah, exactly. And in this particular four lane configuration does have uh, left turn lanes up there. So technically, because of the median, it serves like a five lane roadway strode. Uh, mm. But but four lane roads uh, that have no left turning pockets available are actually one of the most dangerous street designs that we can have in our urban environments. And quite frankly, I'll go so far as to say they should be illegal across any city. Right. Because, you know, you have all sorts of conflicts when you do have somebody who's trying to turn, turn left into that destination, because as a strode, that's the problem. It's not a highway. It's a strode. It's, there's all sorts of places you want to get to. Yeah. And so, you know, you, it, it sets up a conflict where the crash rates are the highest, uh, you know, possible. So, yeah. 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 You, you mix high speed with, with people crossing multiple lanes and distracted Absolutely. while trying to keep their eyes on pedestrians. We just need to clarify, like there are places where we're trying to move high speed to distant places with high volumes. And there are places where we actually want to be, you know, our destinations. And if we want our communities to be our destinations, then we simply cannot design them for high speed, high volume through traffic. It's just, it's an incompatible goal. So this next photo, we're in Surrey. Another angle on the same block. Okay. Crabgrass, some blank walls, empty parking. And this was transformed into a library. Boom. And, uh, you know, again, this isn't perfect, but it's a, people really love the library. A lot of lanes on this, this street, but it is... You know, there have been major improvements for improving it for pedestrians, major investments in trees on the street. And if you go one more photo, so this is just a photo of a parking lot and a, um, the, the raised the train tracks where the transit is. And the next photo shows the mixed use building that they built there. Um, they created an arm's length development corporation to partner with developers on, on major projects like this to get them in the strategic places they needed them. Um, so this includes a hotel and offices um, and it's all on that same block with the plaza in the middle. Right. And this kickstarted developments. That's the plaza. There's some green space on the street. It looks nice. There's actually street life there now. I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I visited in person. And so before 2010, there was basically zero development applications. Right. And then, after they announced this program that they're going to make these major investments, you at first saw four major developments, then seven, then eight. Um, then they actually finished some of these projects in like 2014. And after that, uh, by 2018, they had 25 major projects proposed in a year. I think it's been over 100 uh, projects proposed coming to city council. And we're talking like multiple towers, like major scale projects. And then some like human scale, you know, uh, four-story, six-story built uh, projects as well. 
So once you got a, a, a once the dam opened up, once the water started moving, it started moving faster, right? Right. Because once people saw that other developers are investing in the place, then they can believe that their own investments will succeed. Because if there is reason to believe that even if there's no not many people walking in the street right now or 10 years ago, that there will be soon because there's going to be all these destinations to walk to and all these new homes. And so I can invest in a project that has retail on its ground floor and that's not surrounded by parking because there's going to be people living here. Right. And so once you kickstart that growth, it starts to reinforce itself. And uh, we wrote an, another piece recently just arguing that if you want to keep that momentum going, now the job, so the first task is to kickstart the growth, get that momentum going in the first place. The second task is to cultivate it, to start growing it outwards, like that that amoeba that we were looking at earlier. To um, in, in all of this, the the basic resource, the the basic thing that is of highest value, like gold or oil, is street life. Street right. life is our most precious commodity, and it's. Uh, in a suburban context, it's so a car oriented, it, it is dearly precious. There's very little of it. And so once you have that street life in one place, the job is to coax it outwards, to encourage more development or more destinations for people to walk to, to give people faith that they can invest in more development. So what I'd like to see Surrey do next, and I know they're, they're actually starting to do some of this, is, is placemaking, making the most of what they have, making small investments and turning parking lots into public spaces, building kiosks. If we, we don't have the development in this spot yet, let's build some temporary kiosks and create like a commercial buzz that will encourage someone to make an investment in the development. Make those consistent small investments to expand that walkable urban form and life outwards. Yeah. So let's critique a, a little bit of this uh, and, and let's also address uh, a potential conflict that arises from this this uh, approach of if we have a limited amount of money let's focus that money in going big in a particular area which is actually antithetical to you know kind of what strong towns uh, talks about in terms of you know Chuck Chuck basically says, you know, if we've got X amount of money, let's let's have a little bit of small bets over here, over here, over here, which you directly said, you know, that's not the way to do it from what your research is, is we need to focus this on a particular area. But let's let's take a moment to just step back and you had mentioned, yeah, this is still a very paved environment. I look at this and I still say this is auto centric environment. This is not human habitat. You happen to catch a photo here of, or this is a Google photo of a lot of pedestrians here, but I would get, I would, I would bet real money that normally what we see is a lot of automobile traffic versus people traffic. So um, I, I was pleasantly surprised that when I went there, there actually are a pretty consistent flow of people walking here. Mm -hmm. Um but you're absolutely right, right? Like, yeah, so, I mean, this is um, a disaster the, to me is that we still have a strode. <laughs> this is still a five lane strode now feeding into a, a, a library and it looks like there's a hotel there. I'm assuming there's some, are those residential towers as well or are these office towers? There's residential towers all around this and there okay. would be actually more in the photo today. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about residential towers because you channeled earlier Jan Gale and, and, and Charles Montgomery, the other Chuck, <laughs> Charles talks about in the book Happy City, he talks about that level of happiness uh, of people living in towers, residential towers, and how it, it you know, there, there is a sense of like, you know, that, that uncomfortableness of being on an elevator, going up and down mm. these towers. And, and young Gale talks about how mm. once we're above six stories, yeah. you're now, you're, you're no longer human habitat because you don't yeah, have that yeah. ability to have eye connection. So let's talk it about that tension that takes the, place. Uh, 
the air authority, I think he said that yeah. <laughs> because you're so far from the street, you're, that you're so not far away from the street. You can't even see. Yes. Yeah. If you can't make eye contact and that's, what's beautiful and, and about can't comfortably talk from your balcony correct. to the street. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yes. It's eye contact and comfortably talk. And, yeah. uh, and that's the beauty of Paris is everything is, is yes. that's right. dense, but it's still built to human scale. So talk that's a little right. bit about that conflict that we seem yeah. to have in tension here. Yeah. Which, so all the case studies I looked at were trying to create these downtowns with, with huge towers. And I would love to look at a case study that, that was aiming for more of a human scale that is successful. I know of some cases where people have done that from like blank slate, just like build it all at once. And, and they've made it work with like four or five story uh, buildings. It's It's hard to do in this kind of where you're taking the existing parking lots and turning them into pedestrian friendly buildings because you're fighting that existing parking lot environment. And so you need to allow well, developers- Back up a second. What do you mean by uh, fighting that existing parking lot environment? Well, uh, so it's it's hard to convince developers that it's worth investing in a mixed use tower in a context that is low value in which your view is of parking lots where there's not really much you can walk okay. to easily. In other words, the, the lot next door is, is is still a parking lot. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the broader yeah. environment, the big roads, yeah. the strip right, malls, right, right. the blank walls, yeah, all of that. So the, the solution that a lot of places are going with is, you know, allow more height and then that can make the investment pencil out a bit better or the risk pencil out. Now, here, here's how I think about this. The more we invest, the more we use all the tools that are available for uh, transforming that environment, for creating a more pedestrian friendly environment and kickstarting growth, the less height we need to allow. So height in effect makes up for the fact that we haven't done a great job of creating people friendly streets or all the other things we could do. So if you combined all the tools that I identify in my thesis and more, I think that you could achieve this kind of change without needing as much height. Um, so let's run through the list really quick. Okay, hey, that's the end of part one. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, please uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And in a couple days, I'll be back with part two of this conversation with Dr. Tristan Cleveland. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.